Welcome to the FinTech One-on-One Podcast, episode number 379. This is your host, Peter Renton, chairman and co-founder of FinTech Nexus. Before we get started, I want to remind you about our comprehensive news service, FinTech Nexus News not only covers the biggest fintech news stories, our daily newsletter delivers the 10 most important fintech stories into your inbox every morning. And we have special editions for Latin America as well as UK and Europe. Stay on top of fintech news by subscribing at news.fintechnexus.com slash subscribe. Today on the show, I am delighted to welcome Brock Blake and Donata Ramnishta. They are with Lendio. Brock is the CEO and founder, and uh, Donata is uh, the chief strategy officer. I wanted to get them on the show because I feel like they've done some really interesting work when it comes to small business lending. Lendio has been a leader for some time, and now they've sort of they're taking it to the next level. We talk about the PPP and how that has changed small business lending and really enabled this kind of new era to happen. They introduced this new concept of the three capital C's. We talk about that in some depth. We also talk about the small business owner and what options they have and how they go about the process of deciding what type of financing to get. And we talk about real time, real time access to data, real time capital. And it's, I think, a really exciting concept and one that I'm really bullish on. Anyway, it was a fascinating discussion. Hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the podcast, Brock and Donata. Thanks, Peter. It's always good to be with you and always to uh, share a stage or the podcast with Donata, <laughs> whatever it might be. <laughs> well, thanks to both of you. Looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, excellent. It's welcome back, of course, Brock, because you've been on the podcast before. Donata, it's your first time, so thank you. Let's let's kick it off just by giving um, the listeners a little bit of background um, about yourself. Well, let's start with you, Donata. I first met you when you were at American Express a few years back, so why don't you give us some of the highlights of what you've done in your career to date? Yeah, so um, believe it or not, I can now consider myself a veteran of the fintech space. Oh, I think that's uh, fair. Yeah. <laughs> it, I mean, I, I must have started uh, when I was a, a teenager, right? Um, <laughs> right, exactly. But, <laughs> exactly. But I have been in the fintech space now for uh, over 10 years, right? So soon when fintech sort of was born, starting with American Express when they first launched and began the journey to create non-card lending. So from that inception and uh, joined Lendio six years ago uh, in this endeavor to support the journey of small business and lead strategic partnerships. And through this journey, I've had uh, the privilege to wear many hats within the company. But ultimately, uh, the nice thing about Lendio is that there is one thing that defines all of our job responsibilities, and that is to solve for the small business owners and be able to fuel them so they can reach their dream of entrepreneurship by access to capital. Mm -hmm. So uh, my recent responsibility is uh, being the chief growth officer of Lendio and looking at opportunities of how we continue to extend our mission via strategic partnerships, via that with referral partners, financial institutions, so we can continue our mission to fuel the American dream and fuel small business. Okay. Well, we're going to get into all that in a little bit, but Brock, why don't you give us a a little bit of history and background on you? Yeah. So um, co-founder and CEO of Lendio, um, you know, really started uh, entrepreneurship right out of school, uh, won an entrepreneurial competition and uh, got into, became an entrepreneur, $150,000 started a business that was helping business owners connect to angel investors and VCs and uh, made every mistake in the book. Um, it was a really, really challenging business. 
And but what we learned from that is that the demand for capital was high from small businesses. We just were going about it the wrong way. Um, and uh, so we kind of used those learnings to launch Lendio in 2011. And I can't even believe that to say, you know, we're 11 years into this journey and, and uh, love where we're at and uh, believe we've got not only we've accomplished some amazing things, but we've got a bright future ahead of us. Right, right. OK, so how, how do you describe Lendio today for someone who doesn't know about you guys? Yeah, so I think Lendio for us, I mean, it's a financial ecosystem, uh, financial platform for small businesses and the lenders that uh, provide them capital. Um, and so we're trying to, if we think about those two customers, um, uh, we, for the business owner, we envision a world that where small businesses survive and thrive. Um, and they make it easier for them to get access to capital. We envision a world where a business owner never has to go actually fill out a loan application again, um, where they always kind of have this ongoing, uh, 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 we call always on application. Um, or in a world where lenders um, can efficiently through technology uh, offer loans to small businesses and um, and that uh, and they can reduce their customer acquisition costs and and um, you know things like that. So we're trying to bring this world together and make it more efficient. Um, there's a lot of different players a part of it, but that kind of platform where all of that happens and we have connection points to those two different players is is uh, the way people should think about Lendio. Right, right. Okay. So I want to, uh, I would love to get your sense on now that we're, we're removed from, you know, paycheck protection program was, was a huge deal. I remember Brock, you were really active in the very early days of that, of that program. And um, Lendio was highly active, but now we're, you know, over a year removed from really the end of it all. And I'd be curious to see, with this um, with this distance now that we have, how do you think the PPP, you know, how do you think it's really changed small business lending in this country? Yeah, I mean, I'll start and then Donat, I'd love for you to jump in as well. So, you know, from, I think we look at it from two different perspectives. From the business owner perspective, prior to the pandemic, uh, I think there was some reticence around getting a loan. Like it was like a negative connotation that I needed a loan or it was bad or, or whatever. And, and um, I think that the Paycheck Protection Program and this whole SMB lending being kind of center stage makes it a, you know, a little bit more acceptable. Um, so from that perspective, I think there's some positives. Some of the negatives from the small business owner perspective is that, you know, they the, the idea that money is free, um, that I can get a paycheck protection loan and I can get it forgiven and I don't, you know, ever have to pay that back. And so, you know, there's some learning curves that, that you're going through from that perspective. I think the thing, the area that I'm most excited about, um, you know, from, uh, from this, the, the, the growth of, of SMB lending is what's happened on the banking side, because banks prior to the pandemic, they were focused on loans greater than a million dollars. Mm -hmm. They couldn't profitably underwrite a loan that was $50,000 because they, they have these manual under, underwriting processes and committees and whatnot. And we all know about that. But during the pandemic, their branches were closed. And based, I mean, the government really forced banks to, to focus on smaller customers. Um, and this was one of the, the banner flags that we were carrying as well, that the underserved, the true small businesses needed to be get more attention during the pandemic. And, and that, that actually happened. Uh, most banks, uh, so they were able to do two things. They were basically offer small PPP loans and they were able to offer uh, loans without going into the branch, um, whether it was done through email or online or whatever. And because of that, banks got a taste of online lending, they got a taste of these smaller loan customers. And I think they liked it. Um, and coming out of it, I think the coming out of the pandemic, you got banks that are in a very different mindset than they were before. Um, they always talked about going digital, but now they're embracing and now they're seeking it. Now they're looking for, uh, you know, partnership opportunities and, and, um, 
we've been talking about this evolution for a long time. I do think that it, it will accelerate it on the banking side. Um, and the winner will be the small business owner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and what I would add to that is, um, furthermore, we got to learn each side of the equations. So you've got the banks and you've got the FinTech and there was some sense at some point in the journey that there was some type of rivalry, right? Mm -hmm. That somehow we were going to eat each other's lunch. And the Paycheck Protection Program, what it showed is that actually there is an opportunity for each side to hone in on its strength and collaborate in order to perpetuate the mission of small business and together, you know, come at the other end and fuel small business. And th that process of being forced into those you know, solutions together did teach us to hone in on our strength and continue that culture of collaboration forward. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 from my perspective, I feel like it's, you know, the the PPP showed that, uh, you know, that fintech really had, you know, had had come of age in a way that uh, it hadn't hadn't before. I don't think people really appreciated all the advances that we had. And I mean, to me, I mean, obviously there was some fraud in the program. There's going to be fraud in any government program, but there it did so much good and it showed the government and, you know, and, and banks and fintechs together can really come together and, and, and work as a team to help small business. And it was as a small business owner, my, I've, I've been a small business owner my entire career. So I'm very passionate about small business as well. And, and we were a recipient of the PPP and it was, uh, it was a godsend for us. So, so anyway, then if you look at, I, I'm curious now that we've, you know, a lot of businesses had an influx of cash. Many didn't need it. Um, but are we fully, are we back to like 2019 where access to capital is, you know, or, or, or demand for capital, I should really mean demand for capital is back to where it was, or is it still some, some sort of dislocation in the process that's, that's come out of PPB? I mean, what, what's the state of small business lending today? Yeah. You know, the demand for capital is as high as I've seen it. Um, okay. You know, especially recent, we, uh, we have a lot of business owners. And I think the part of that is some uncertainty in the market, you know, are rates going to keep going up. How's that going to affect business? Is there a looming recession coming? And, you know, I think some of that, uh, you know, get capital before you need it, um, I think is, is happening. And, and, um, I also think that coming out of the pandemic, you've got lenders that are eager to put capital to work and, and are looking for, you know, uh, to continue to grow and get back to pre-pandemic levels. And so you've got this perfect storm where I don't feel like, you know, you look at some of the consumer and mortgage and other auto and other loans where they're seeing some softening and they're seeing some reduction in the volume and other things like that. We're not seeing that in small business. Hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, this last quarter was a phenomenal quarter as far as the volume that we've done, high watermarks, uh, you know, at Lendio being funded, um, even, you know, pre-pandemic and whatnot. So, um, and, and, you know, I think what's uh, the other kind of interesting kind of aspect of the market as we look at it today is there's this blending of, of, of players of who offers capital. Um, and no one knows this better than Donata. She's leading kind of as our chief growth officer, w w this division we call partner solutions. And, and we started to, you know, we used to talk about partners, which would be people that would send us re small business referrals. Mm -hmm. And we used to say lenders, those that would lend capital. Well, now they're all under this umbrella of partners. And the reason why is because a lot of the partners are actually lending capital. Right. And a lot of the lenders are actually referring their right. declines and their turndowns. I mean, the bend of who those customers are, you know, whether it be you got the Stripes and the QuickBooks Capital and, and the Square Capital and all of these where there's just, um, you know, embedded finance, embedded lending is so hot right now as far as, hey, let's take the, that customer's data and leverage it to provide a great lending experience and, and proactively underwrite these customers and get them the loans they need. It's, it's, it's an exciting time. And we could talk about, you know, the risks that, that uh, exist or where we think the market's going, but right now there's just a lot of energy in the market that we feel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so I want to I want to go back to the session you had at our big event at FinTech Nexus USA um, a couple of months ago. Very very entertaining session, which I will link to in the show notes. And Donato, I want to I want to turn to you because you introduced a new concept. At least it was new to me. Um, the idea of the three capital C's, because we talk about the the five C's um, of lending, but what are the three capital C's? Yeah, well. Uh... Thanks for asking that, uh, because at Lendia, we can't stop talking about that notion. Look, Brock noted how traditionally small business lending has been overlooked because financial institutions applied the same measures that they would apply, frankly, to medium and commercial loans mm -hmm. into small business loans. And we know that that process is indeed inefficient and it didn't necessarily uh, support this notion for financial, traditional financial institutions to invest in small business lending. And often traditional financial institutions saw small business lending as something that they had to do, right? It's overly costly to issue a $50,000 loan, an $80,000 loan, given that same process that one would apply for higher loan sizes. So the notion of shifting the traditional five C's of underwriting, you know, when you look at character, when, um, you know, that makes me actually cringe, just <laughs> thinking of the notion of, I'm looking at the small business from the character perspective. What does that even mean, especially in light of wanting to reduce bias in underwriting, right? So at Lendio, we are thinking about the concept and pushing the concept that it is the three capital C's that should indeed overshadow really the five C's traditionally applied in underwriting. And those three capital C's are connectivity to data, the very importance of pooling information and data about small businesses. And it isn't just about historical performance. It's holistic data that allows us predictive behavior. It's correlation of that data, right? We apply technology to correlate pieces of information together. Um, and ultimately categorization, well, I should say categorization first and then correlation, right? So there's this discipline of connectivity to data, categorization of data, and ultimately correlation of that data that should enable uh, how we underwrite small businesses. And really when you look at sort of in raw layman's terms, that is indeed applying true AI to small business underwriting, allowing data not only to assess historical information on a small business, but also develop predictive behavior on where that small business will go based on decisions that have occurred in that small business uh, process, right? So it's this notion that we enable the data to be able to allow for decisioning in small business underwriting versus getting to nuances of character. Because what happens to small businesses who have thinner files, right? Mm -hmm. They still have the ability to access capital. They should have the ability to access capital. And by leveraging data appropriately, we can enable that while still managing risk appropriately, because that's also very important. So then what and kind I think of, what it, you know, go on, Brock. Let me just throw this in there. And I think some of the, 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 the those that will benefit the most from this will be those that are underserved today. Um, and, you know, minority owned businesses, women owned businesses or others that, and it wasn't intentional. I don't want to demonize uh, banks or others that were underwriting based off of, you know, this character, um, but, but, when that you can just look at the data and they were underserved comparatively mm -hmm. and they're um and so you know when you when you evaluate a business based off of data points that are like what is the true health of that business what's the probability of payback and and remove some of those other demographic or biased information then what you, I, we believe is and will continue to happen is some of the underserved small businesses um, will be on an even playing field Okay, can I get a sense then of what data you're talking about? Is this, are you talking about accounting data? Uh, you, you're talking about like, you know, inventory data and what, what are you, what are you talking about? Yeah, when we reference data is really every element that enables us to predict 
the uh, health of a small business forward. So as, as I noted, traditionally it has been the historical cash flow data alone that would enable predictive uh, outcomes of, hey, if a financial institution would underwrite a particular business. Now we're pooling data such as what type of decisions is the small business owner making relating to the business? What percent is their rent as a portion of the revenue that they generate? And what does that collectively say? What is that shown to say holistically within the segment that they operate in, right? So if you have a hair salon that spends X percent on rent in a particular geography as a percent of revenue, is that correlated to a particular outcome? So it's really assessing the small business, not just on historical, but their future potential, right? So every element of data becomes important, um, but small businesses aren't scrutinized on a particular one variable and be left out of their ability to access capital and grow their business, right? Mm -hmm. It is this holistic approach by looking at of a multitude of data and how it correlates together that then we enable them to have a better chance at access to capital versus being knocked out because of one particular variable. So uh, let, let's take that to one step further. Like she talked about categorization. Like we used to look at bank data just raw, like, okay, is what's, what's their average daily balance? And let's underwrite based off that. But now can you take the raw transaction data and can you start putting using machine learning can you take it in and identify what is a balance sheet item versus what is a profit and loss statement item? You know, what is truly revenue? What is expense? And, and, um, and if, if you look at enough bit raw transaction data and you've at auto categorized that and, and now we can start to like you say, oh, well, percentage of rent or percentage versus payroll or um, so it is taking data. We want data from any source we could possibly get, right? Whether it's payroll data, whether it's bank account data, whether it's you know uh, from you know their their uh, their their bookkeeping data, other uh, other things like that. But um, but it's it's taking the raw data and doing something with it to be to make smarter decisions, and then and then correlate them together, piece them together in ways to be able to evaluate that business. Owner. So from what you're saying, are you guys creating like your own, you know, uh, like next generation underwriting engine? Are you, are you, is that what you're doing? We have a product we, uh, we now offer to banks who we call Axis. Um, and, you know, right now we're in kind of beta where it's not, we're not in, in stealth mode, but we haven't shouted from the rooftops yet because, um, you know, we're still in beta with, and the beta customers are traditional banks. Um, mm. And we love it because they are so, they're, it's such a different mindset now than it was pre-pandemic. They are like right. welcoming this. And so what we're doing is we're taking their credit policy and their underwriting, like what, do you, what did you traditionally look at, which was kind of algorithmic, A plus B equals C. Well, let's adopt that and then let's put that on steroids and and, and we're going to pull in, you know, LexisNexis and, and Dun & Bradstreet and, and bank data and all of, and by the way, all of this is only available because now we have open data, this, all these infrastructure players that let us go out and connect all these data sources that we didn't have access to a few years ago. Um, so we, we pull all that, we do a bunch of correlation is this business owner, you know, on the public search records, do they match? And and let's um, and so yes, the answer the question the answer to your question is yes. Um, but we'll start you know shouting from the rooftops and making a much bigger deal you know come this fall. Right. Okay. Well, what, what I would add to that, Peter, is um, Lendio also has the opportunity and the responsibility. Well, first of all, we have to acknowledge we've been operating for 11 years as that intersection of connecting small businesses to sources of capital. Mm -hmm. So in addition to sort of looking at how financial institutions underwrite and adopting that into the rules engine, we have the opportunity to offer those financial institutions the data, the information around small business behavior, because we do now have historical data across mm -hmm. all different loan products within Lendio. Yeah, right. um, and I don't know what other financial institution does have that rich data across 
so many varied products and across various lenders like Lendio does. So again, I say that it's an opportunity, but also responsibility to then make something do with that data and offer it to our bank customers to enrich the way that they decision, right? We do believe financial institutions have been doing business lending proper and in a certain way, but there's always an opportunity to take new information over 11 years of Lendio being at that intersection and enrich that process that they currently deploy. Banks, oh, I, banks historic. Okay, sorry about that. No, We're getting excited about this topic. Yeah, you, you yeah. keep going, Brock. It's fine. <laughs> one topic, one thing I'll add to that is that banks just historically haven't been able to compete. They can't compete with On Deck. They can't compete with uh, Enova, um, and uh, you know all, they couldn't compete with Cabbage and American Express and whatnot. They just they didn't have the technology. They didn't have the sophistication. They didn't have the uh, underwriting capabilities to compete. Um, and now. It might, they might be able to offer a lower cost of capital, but you know, when it takes six or eight weeks to underwrite that process. Um, and so now what we have the ability to do is we have the uh, ability to help them compete uh, or deploy capital uh, in an efficient manner through technology. Um, and then a differentiator is that we're also, we have a marketplace. Um, so we can, let's give you the technology and then let's send you new customers. Um, and the fact that we can kind of do both together is a unique kind of um, differentiator for us, where it's not just the SaaS technology platform and it's not just customer, we can do both. Right, right. So I want to actually go back to the, like the, the small business side of things, because yeah. you're, you're a small business owner. The thing about small businesses, it, it's, uh, you've, it's not just everyone, there's so many different options for small business credit. Like there's, you know, th there's a term loan, there's a credit card, there's a merchant cash advance, there's factoring, um, you know, asset back lending, there's, you know, there's all sorts of different types of products. Um, yeah. And obviously, the average small business owner is is not a sophisticated financial analyst. How, what are you doing on that perspective? Like when a small business comes to Lendia and they said, we need money, do you do you point them in a certain direction? Or how does that work? Yeah, that's a great question. So business owners, um, you know, they don't come in knowing what product they need or want. Um, they they come in and they say, I need $70,000. Uh, you tell me. Uh, and so, you know, we use that information um, and we now have done hundreds of thousands of loans for uh, I love, we lost you, but we lost you, Brock. Did you, we'll, 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 um, are you right? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. We can. Yeah. Okay. We'll edit Sorry. that out. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, so we've done hundreds of thousands of loans, uh, over $13 billion in loans across every industry, every geography, every category. We know which borrowers are getting approved and declined. And so that's part of our secret sauce is to be able to know when a borrower comes in, what data are we gathering from them? And um, we, we use, um, we, we compare them to businesses that have come in before. Let's say it's a Texas, uh, a restaurant in Texas. We can look at the last 500 restaurants in Texas that have been funded. And we can say, okay, when they were offered, uh, which, which across all these loan products and loan categories, uh, when they were offered a bunch of different loan products, which offer did they select the most? Mm -hmm. Um, and what that, what we, we think about is if they're, if they have options and they choose one product more so than others, then that's probably the preferred product. that's the best fit for them. And, and if they meet that criteria, then they are going to rank the highest on our list. And then we'll rank it lower uh, uh, as we go on. So we're always optimizing for likelihood to accept the offer. Right. Um, and then we're comparing it against other businesses that are lookalikes, right? By time in business, by industry, by geography, other things like that. So, but we always, uh, a core part of kind of our, our promise is, because is options that they have three, four options to be able to choose from that they speed, that it happens quickly. And it's a, there's a trusted experience that we're going to deliver to them the best opportunities that they have available for them. Um, so we, we, our, our system and our technology 
is optimized to get them the best product and then kind of guides them through that experience. Okay. Um, so the other thing you, you talked, like you, you mentioned at the, at the start, and I know you talked about it in your, in your session at our event, um, there's this sort of, you know, on-demand on demand loans where you don't actually have to fill out an application. You just, uh, you know, the, the, the software that you're using knows that you're going to be running short of, short of capital in two months time or for whatever, like how, how close to, how close to reality are we? Um, how, how close to that is that to reality today? Um, we're, we're extremely close. I mean, we, it's, uh, there's two things that have to happen. So mm-hmm. the technology exists. Um, we're able to do that for our small business owners where, um, but the most important app thing is you have to get access to streaming data. Um, and so you have to get access to, you have to get permission from the customer to give you access to streaming data, which means you have to add value to them. So they're saying, oh yeah, I'm willing to give them access to, to the streaming data. Um, and you know, we, we made an acquisition a few years ago. Um, we called our Sunrise product, where we're now, which is this full-fledged accounting, bookkeeping, cash flow management tool um, that syncs to their bank account um, every day. And, and as with those customers that we have, you know, access to their, their, their bank data regularly and their invoice data, their uh, APAR data, we have the ability to alert them, you know, you, when, when uh, cash, is, cash is low or uh, we can forecast out for them when they're gonna need a loan, we can give them alerts. And um, so we just did this last week. We actually, Sunrise was a separate product for Lendio. Um, you had to like leave Lendio, go sign up in Sunrise and not whatnot. We actually just brought those two pieces together. So your capital experience and your financial cash flow management experience is now one under mm-hmm. Lendio. So every business owner that signs up now gets access to both of those tools. So now it's uh, becoming a reality at a much bigger scale than what it's been, you know, um, heretofore, uh, because not everyone went, went to our Sunrise product, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Got it. Got it. Okay, so let's talk, let's talk about the the banks you're working with. I mean, you talked about the changes that the PPP brought as far as mindset for banks, but do do banks have? I mean, you talk particularly the smaller banks. I imagine they don't really have a great internal IT capabilities. I mean, are you are you able to work with all different kinds of banks? Yeah, that's a great question. It, you are correct. But um, what the way that we've attempted to solve with our access platform for financial institutions, and like Brock mentioned, we are in beta phase with two of the traditional financial institutions uh, specific with access, uh, is to enable uh, those banks with little effort to integrate with access. And when I say little, it's in context, right? There's still a process by which we have to exchange uh, information and API connectivity. We help them with all of that, but the heavy lifting doesn't really lie on the FI side, right? So we've taken and solved for that integration to be as seamless as possible because we do recognize that they don't have a staff of you know, engineers on the other side to be able to solve for it. So that's the approach that we've taken. And frankly, part of our sort of uh, rollout around having multiple betas is to ensure that when we go to general market, that we're ready for that integration to be seamless, right? We're attempting to solve for it because we recognize it is a hindrance to the process. The other part in working with financial institutions, traditional financial institutions that we have to recognize and a hurdle that we're collaborating on is ensuring that we get regulators on board as well, right? So as you know, regulators, they all mean well, they want to ensure that they're protecting small business, but sometimes regulator expectations does hinder financial institutions in the way that they behave. Mm-hmm. So we're working very closely with them to make sure that we're getting regulators on board to say, we're all on the same side here. We're trying to solve to ensure that we get 
capital to Main Street America. So those are the issues. There's a technological issue, and then there is um, the the portion of getting the regulators on board and generating uh, comfort there. And then the great opportunity then, it's clearly seen, especially by the small community banks who want to deploy capital in their local communities. They see the potential for growth via injection of technology in the process. Yeah, that's that's great because that's uh, that's still so important. A lot of a lot of um, small businesses like to bank with their local community bank or credit union. You know, that's just uh, that's a really big you know big driving force on it for many small businesses. So uh, I want to we're almost running out of time, but so I want to but there's a couple of topics I want to get to, and that is first one. Um, you know, we we live in a you know, we've lived through this multi-year period of low interest rates. I mean, if you actually go back to like 2008 and we've lived through like 14 years of um, abnormally low interest rates and now rates are higher than they have been. And how is that kind of um, impacting, you know, access to capital for small businesses? Are some of them, are some of them being priced out or what's, what's the state of play there? Yeah, so the 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 most important thing to, uh, on small business and the rates, we get this question all the time, is that the the small business rates are not tied as closely or directly correlated to uh, like the consumer mortgage rates. So it's right. not like this evolution like that changes every single month based off of the Fed rate. Uh, small business, most banks have already priced in margin, and and so they're already starting even when the rates were very low. They already had. Um, they were going to be higher than a mortgage or, or you know, auto or consumer loan. Um, and what that means is they don't fluctuate as as much either. Uh, you know, if if the the rates go up a little bit, you know, it's not going to have a significant impact on on what the banks are going to do is because they already have built in margin. Um, they have to. They they have to be able to price that in. Um, for our fintech lenders. You know, a lot of times their cost to capital is coming through warehouse lines that are negotiated over many years. It may be tied to a prime rate or other thing like that. But again, it's not, um, you know, it's, it may be the difference between, you know, uh, it may be a 16.5% rate versus a 17% rate. It's not enough to influence that, that uh, the borrowing behavior enough when they're making a, such an important ROI decision. Um, so, uh, the the rates are something that we're watching now. If they're if there's significant impact as far as them doubling or you know other things like that, then I think it would have um, a negative impact on 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 borrowing. But as we see it right now, uh, like I said at the beginning, the demand for capital is high, the supply for capital is high, and we're not seeing that uh, kind of one for one uh, change as we do in in some of the consumer side. Right, right. Okay. So I'd like to I'd like to close um, with each of you answering this question, if I could. Um, you know, what are you most excited about when it comes to the future of small business in this country? Donata, I'll start with you. Well, um, you're starting with me, but I am going to steal this from what Brock shared at the last Lended com- conference. Okay. I love the journey that we at Lendio believe small business lending will evolve to in a very near future. And that is the journey going from this notion of how we used to use MapQuest to get from one place to the other, to now the evolution into ways where small business lending will be enabled with real time data and a very slick customer experience to enable small businesses to focus more on what they do best, which is run the small businesses and their ability to view access to capital as a real time uh, sort of notion, right? At any point in time, they can see what their eligibility is, right? Based on data and information that will be integrated. That will be a game changer and that gets me uber excited about the future of small business. And frankly, what that will translate to is the future of our economies, because, you know, we keep talking about it, but ultimately small business is indeed what fuels economies. So I am excited. And then the other thing is, we're not going to forget about small business anymore. There is a spotlight in it and it's not going away. 
and I'm stoked about it. And I'm stoked that we at Lendio get to participate in shining that light and mm-hmm. solving for it. Mm-hmm. Okay, Brock, last word. So I, I would echo what Donata said, but I would add to it that I, I am I am thrilled that um, I, I feel like since 2008, so much of kind of this advancement of lending has all happened outside of banks. Banks have provided warehouse lines and capital and, you know, but they actually haven't really embrace online lending um, the way that they could, uh, whether it was technology, you know, whether I, I, and there's a lot of reasons why. And I think that in three to five years from now, you're going to have every bank in America that offers small business, they're, they're going to have a similar experience to what you would have today if you went to any one of the fintech lenders. And I really, truly believe it's, it's finally, um, though we've been talking about this for a long time, it's finally the moment where banks will embrace that. And, and I think it required PPP for this to happen right. um, because they were forced to. They, they, they literally had no other reason, no other options uh, but to accept it. And, and because of that, they're like, OK, it's not so bad. We can do this. You know, this is good for us. And um, so I, I'm super excited when when a business owner can have that type of experience from every bank in the, in America. Now I have options and across every loan product and lower capital. And, and it's just good for the small business. Like, and, and like Donata said, and, and who is the kind of the backbone of the economy. So it's, uh, it's an exciting time to be in the market. We're um, thrilled to, to be a part, a player in it and, and participate in that investment and, and the, uh, the innovation that's occurring. Okay, we'll have to leave it there. Brock and Donata, it's always so much fun to chat with you guys. So thanks for coming on the show today. Thanks for having us, Peter. Okay, see ya.